Welcome to Rights for Women. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And this is our second attempt. So I'm hoping that we actually get through the whole thing. I am, yeah, I'm really happy that we finally got to connect. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to ask you to start with, I want to say congratulations on the 10 year anniversary of the Littlest Coffee Shop in Kabul. It was a runaway success and it's a much loved book. I know there's very few people I know who haven't, haven't actually read this book. So I wanted to ask first of all about this book and before we get on to talking about the Moroccan daughter, did the popularity of the Littlest Coffee Shop surprise you at the time? You know, it actually did. Um, I had already published in the US and it was doing fine. But in the, and also took off so fast. Honestly, I had no idea that it was that popular. Yeah, it, it really was here. And I think um, your subsequent, you know, follow on books did really well too. So uh, it's been wonderful to see. I think it's one of those perennial books, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't age and people can keep coming back to. So congratulations on that. Have you got, um, have you got things planned for that anniversary? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, you know what, with the pandemic, obviously I'm not doing any traveling and that sort of cele celebrating, but you know, I'm doing, you know, some different motions online and stuff like that, but it's uh, what the pandemic has made us all stay pretty low key. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you're in Mexico. So, um, you know, dealing with with a lot more, uh, I guess, the effect of COVID a lot more than we are here in Australia, you know, in, over there in the US as well. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's kind of scary times. Yeah, I think we're definitely all feeling it. Well, Deb, this is a um, this is an episode that I call the heart of writing, where I talk to an author each month who I has really struck me as someone that has a lot of heart in their writing, and and it's more than just about you know getting words down and getting a book out. And on your website, you have a beautiful introduction. It says, "I'm a hairdresser and a storyteller. I never dreamed I could be a writer." But I believe in the magic of life and not being afraid to try what you thought, what you never thought you could do. And it struck me in reading The Moroccan Daughter, there is a sort of mystical or, or magical thread almost in there. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how that sort of element has played out in your own life and in your writing. You know, I think that I've always... Um let's just say I've never discounted the magic in life because I have seen so many examples of it basically in my own life, in my children's life, in my grandchildren's life. And I do believe that uh, if you set your mind to something or if you follow your path, if you follow your heart, uh, the magic kind of happens without even trying so hard. And I'm a real, um, I follow my heart. I Sometimes it leads me to weird places, but I really have a, a kind of a natural intuition. And so when I feel that intuition speaking to me, I follow it. And, you know, I mean, I'm like one of these people that have dreams. I've always been a dreamer. And often um, they come true, right? Yeah. And it's really kind of weird. And if I wake up in the morning and I say to, I say to my partner, I say, I've had a dream. He, he knows that he's either in trouble or, or something's going to change in our life. And that's my character B. She also has dreams just like myself. Yes, for sure. I wondered if B was was sort of based on, you know, yourself or anyone that you knew intimately. Well, we're going to get on to talking about your characters because I know that you do like to draw inspiration from real life. But 
that idea of following your intuition, was that what brought you to writing, would you say? I think so. Um, I, I had been journals of my time in Afghanistan because that's basically where the real writing started. And I wanted to write this book called There's Warlords in My Living Room because I thought I really had this window that I could see things that other people aren't seeing. And so, yeah, I, I thought, you know, why not? I didn't know I could. That's, I think, what, uh, for me, I didn't realize that I could fail at this. I just thought, you know what, let me, let me give it a whirl. Yeah, and I get the impression, you know, just reading your bio and a bit about your life, that's sort of how you've lived your life. You know, let's give it a try and see what happens. You know what, in a good and in a bad way, that's exactly what I do. I think that possibly if I mellowed a little bit as I've gotten older, but I did the same thing with coming to Mexico. Okay, well, let's just give this a whirl. And I opened up a salon here and my, you know, half of my family's here because we're just giving it a win. It's working out perfectly. Fantastic. Well, Mexico is just one of the sort of exotic places, I guess, that you have found yourself over the years. Um, and it's been 10 years since the first coffee shop book come, came out. You had written a book prior to that. Was it one or two prior to the coffee shop? One, the, the couple beauty school. Yes, that's right. Um, and a lot of your books are set, most of them, in quite exotic locations from Zanzibar, Haiti, Mexico, back to Kabul, and now in Morocco. And I'm just wondering, what is it about these sorts of locations that does inspire you to write and to tell a story that's set there? I, um, mostly, like, I love to travel and I love uh, searching out the, the kind of the ends behind the closed doors when I'm traveling. I, I'm not a traditional traveler. I like to really meet the people. I like to be hands-on. Um, I'm not a resort traveler whatsoever. I do like my creature comforts, but I, I like to see things that maybe the average tourist isn't going to see. And so I find that that's really inspirational because I think that often, you know, people want to see something that's uh, different than, say, their vacation, right? I think people have been to Morocco, people have been to Mexico, but it's nice to peek behind the doors and see how families operate. And so I, you know, if I find a nice location, I do love to find a night that will fit into that location. And I had been wanting to write a book that said in, was set in Morocco for years. Yeah, well, I, I went to Morocco in my 20s. So it's quite a while ago now. And it was one of those places, I was only there for a few days, loved it, uh, mainly in Marrakesh. And it was wonderful. It was, it was a place I always wanted to go back to, but I haven't actually made it back yet. But um, it was wonderful reading The Moroccan Daughter and feeling like I was actually there again. So thank you for that. I really enjoyed that aspect of the book, but which brings us to The Moroccan Daughter. So could you tell listeners what it's about and maybe where you did get that inspiration from? The Moroccan Daughter is uh, about a family and about a a young woman, the Moroccan daughter, Amina. Uh, it's about it's secrets. It's about forbidden love. It's about the uh, clash of cultures. It's about uh, lo loving who you want to love. And it's about family traditions. And it's about Amina coming home, uh, a Moroccan American or a Moroccan who's been living in the United States and has secretly married her American husband, which has gone against the tradition of her family. And she is now coming home to face 
the music to that. Yes, and it's so there's Amina's story, and there's also a, a quite a range of characters that who we meet. You know, so she travels to Morocco with B and Charlie, and then we meet additional members of Amina's family there. Amira, sorry. Um, would you tell us they asked? There is a really interesting cast of characters, and I'm really interested to know where you get the inspiration for your characters from and maybe where the inspiration for these particular characters came from. Well, Amina was, um, the whole story, the Moroccan daughter was inspired by a young woman who literally is from Morocco, um, was going, went to school in Paris and met her uh, now a married husband. And her father also had worked uh, as a uh, director of prisons and she literally lived on the grounds of the prison. So she, her story was that spark that started, you know, this book can really be made. Um, and so, you know, Amina is inspired by the real person I met and uh, which is really exciting. And then B uh, and Charlie were also characters in Island on the Edge of the World. And so I was able to bring them into the Moroccan daughter and Billy is like this third culture kid. She was a missionary kid from, uh, uh, lived in the jungle of Venezuela. And so she's out of sorts with life in the United States because she hasn't really been there that long, just as Amina is trying to find her way. So that's why the two of them, you know, get on so well. Mm. And B is the quirky, over the top, eccentric, bohemian, uh, medium tarot card reading, turban wearing grandmother. She's fabulous. I love her. <laughs> and the other interesting character I, I really enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, B is by far. Sorry, go on, Deb. Yep, we have no, a bit of a delay, so I'll fix all this up later in the edit. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know. Um, B is my favorite character of all my characters ever. Oh wow. Written. And I I aspire to I aspire to be B one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and the interesting thing about B. And I hope you don't mind me giving this away. Is she's blind, or, or almost blind? Yes, B. You know, B is blind, and that's kind of interesting because. Um, so I became a hypnotist, right? And this oh. was um, I had to go to hypnosis school, and then while I was in hypnosis school, one of the instructors was a blind girl who was so tuned in everything around her. She saw things mentally. She felt things that like it was the most bizarre experience to watch her, to spend time with her. And that's when I thought I want to have a character like her because it was so her existence was so much deeper and so much fuller because she did not just rely on her eyes to mm. see. Yeah, there's that thing, isn't it, that when you're deprived of one sense, it heightens all the other senses. And of course, because she's in Morocco and obviously she can't see what's around her, but there's some great writing and scenes where you you know, B is going through the marketplace and other people are describing it to her. And I really loved that because we get that really sensory experience that B's getting. Yeah, I think, um, I think that having B blind is fabulous. 
uh, in Morocco, but it didn't start out that way because when I went into Morocco, I, I went into Fez. I'd been there before a couple times, but when, but never with you know researching a book. And when I walked through that gate, and I started trying, you know, walking to get to the Riyadh. I realized I thought, oh my goodness, there is no way in a million years, B is going to be able to manage in this Medina. Mm. There was donkeys nearly trampling us. There was uneven step everywhere. There was people darting in front of you, alongside of you. You know, the, the alleyways, it's 9,000 little alleyways. You know how the Medina is in Marrakesh. Yeah. Make it even tighter. Oh, that no, no. it was, and I, I was so, I thought I'd made like the biggest mistake ever by having be uh, blind. And um, one thing that happened is my girlfriend came along with me and she had just come off knee surgery and she was struggling. I thought, Linda's not going to make it through Fez nor is B, and now what am I going to do? And um, the manager of the Riyadh we had rented, he came, he said, don't worry, I got it taken care of. And he had a guy come with a wheelchair, and we we're able to load Linda in the wheelchair. And at that point, experience Fez with her eyes closed which was amazing because you know, it's like, what are you see? What are you hearing? What are you feeling? And, you know, then just being able to sit in that wheelchair for just a moment and being wheeled around Fez with your eyes closed, it was, it was amazing. And it made a world of difference. Mm. And, you know, be, be get around in the, in the Medina, but, you know, just being able to understand what it's like to be in the Medina without sight was important. Yeah. And those things that you notice more, you know, that you wouldn't notice if you had your eyes open or if you could see. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It must have been great to do that. And, and, you know, I know that you had been there prior. Yeah, because the research. There's... Sorry, go. <laughs> No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say it must have been amazing to and such a fun time to go with your girlfriend for the research trip to Morocco. Oh, you know, it was crazy. Um, the My research partner uh, had a medical emergency. The one She's the one that goes with me to, with all my trips. And all of a sudden... 10 days before the trip, she's unable to go. So I put out an SOS to my girlfriends because I had to these huge, huge riads in the middle of the Medina and Fez. And I'm thinking, there is no way I want to be in those Medinas by myself. Yeah. You know, it just felt. And so I had two girlfriends came along with me and we laughed and had so much fun <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> um and the, the other character i found really interesting was samira who is the moroccan housekeeper for the family in um in fez so could you tell us a little bit about her because she has a, a completely different background to the others as well Samira is from the mountains up in the Atlas Mountains, and she's from the, the town of Imjil, where the marriage festival takes place. And she was about marriage age, which may be 14, 13, 14, 15. And she was um, going to have to get married. And she fled Imjil with the help of her brother and basically ran away and went to uh, Fez, and it was um, it was uh, Amina's grandmother who found her in in the 
Medina and took her in and she stayed with that family well the whole time and mm. um you know she has all this to the family and so she's so crucial in the story because you it is these people who are uh you know she's the housekeeper she does know the family better than anybody mm. she's raised those children like her own she knows the husband's secrets she knows the mother who's past secrets she's been there for everything every event but yet she's still the servant mm. and so that, that's that's difficult for her yeah yeah and I liked that contrast you know with Samir Samir and then the other female characters um so we do have a lot of ages and backgrounds and uh, different cultural, you know, backgrounds and everything in your character. So there's Amira. Amira, I'm getting, I've read the book, of course, but it's Amira or Amina. I've written down Amira, but. Amina, Amina. <laughs> Amina, okay. Um, Amina. Amina. So Amina is Moroccan that lives in the US. Um, Samira, as we've just said, is the housekeeper. Um, Naziha is Am Amira's Amina's sister, um, she's about to be married in an arranged marriage, um, which is something you mentioned earlier. And then there's Charlie and B, of course. Um, I'm just wondering, you, you do seem to love to amplify women's voices in your writing and across all ages and backgrounds. Was that something that you really were keen to do in The Moroccan Daughter? I think so. That's, um, I. I like that. Like I, that's where I'm comfortable. It, you know, basically, I love to hear the the women's voices. I think that it's important to hear them from different age perspectives. It's interesting because you, the older characters, can say things that others cannot. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that have that wisdom. I've. Uh, I love the fact that Charlie is American, but yet she she's so out of sync with the United States and how things really work there because she'd been out of the country so long. Amina, she's she's balanced between being the American girl and being the Moroccan girl, depending on the country she's in. And mm. so she she struggles with the tradition versus you know modern. It's it's difficult. And so um, I think that I do love to have female voices. Uh, I mean, I had probably the most. And, and Deb, you don't shy away from um, any of the sort of cultural issues either. You know, some of the things that are explored and mentioned, discussed by the characters in the novel are quite sensitive, I guess, cultural issues, you know, the women's role in Moroccan society, the issue of arranged marriages, uh, you know, you touch on, on aspects of the Islamic religion and even terrorism. Do you use sensitivity readers or how do you go about handling those topics that are, you know, more sensitive that way? Well, first of all, I always use sensitivity readers. Uh, it's, you must. Um, I bring in readers from, like, I will have somebody who is, uh, works, uh, expert with Islam to make sure that I haven't, um, said things that I shouldn't be saying or that I'm correct at what I'm saying with just the words and the way things are spoken. Um, I always do that. I always have different people from um, like, for instance, with the Moroccan daughter, you have the Arab Moroccans, and then you have the Amazigh, which are the mountain people, you know, from the Atlas Mountains, you have those two totally different cultures right there. And so I did, I had readers from both to make sure that I was representing whatever I'm saying uh, correctly, because I think that's crucial. And then uh, um, uh, the woman I told you about earlier, who Amina was the inspiration, she was the inspiration 
for Amina. She's Moroccan. Uh, she's been in the United States, Moroccan American. And so she stayed on as a consultant mm -hmm. through the entire process of the book. So I think that bringing in um, a lot of people uh, to make sure that you are saying things correctly is crucial. Yeah, yeah. And it shows in the book too, you know, it's, it's, it comes together really beautifully and it's all just woven into the narrative in a, in a really seamless way. So I really enjoyed those aspects of the story. And of course it gives it that depth, doesn't it? You know, the, it's not just sort of skimming the surface. It, it does have the depth of those issues about around the culture. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, Deb, you wrote your first book back in 2007 and I'm just wondering, since then, so we're now in 2021, what would be some of the key things that you feel that you've learned about the writing life and the publishing industry over that time? It, the publishing industry has changed so much from the first book until now. Things are, things are different. Um, you know, when I first started, the publishing and we didn't have ebooks, right? Mm. So things have changed uh, a lot. Uh, you you do the difference, the big, big, big difference now from the beginning when I my first book is how you have to be connected on social media. That you know there was no social media with yeah. my first book, right? And um, so it things. I love how I can connect directly with my readers through Instagram, through Facebook. I like that. And so, um, you know, that is very interesting. And that's not even a part of the writing aspect yeah. of, um, it's what you have to do all the time is constant, which is, you know, I mean, it takes a little bit to get used to, you feel like there's a lot of self-promotion, which doesn't feel that natural for me. Um, I was a little bit of a late bloomer in the Instagram game, and I'm trying to play catch up now. And so <laughs> that is the one thing that has been a big, big change. Very true. Yes, I agree with all of that. And and what about in terms of your writing, Deb? Do you think that your writing has changed a lot? And what do you feel that you've learned over the years about writing? I think that I'm finding my, my groove, right? I really like the books that I'm writing now. I like, uh, I love having uh, the returning characters. I like having mm. B and Charlie returning uh it's not a series but it's just you you come into the book familiar with these characters i like that um i i think i know more what what i am now mm. i think i know more my writing style or the stories that i like versus trying to uh when you you know trying to you you can't just keep making rewriting the little coffee shop of Kabul over and over and over again but I do write about women I do write about women's friendship that's my thing I like that I like I like how women come together and their voices can be heard I'm a hairdresser I'm in the beauty shop still I have a salon in Mexico I'm surrounded by women all the time, all my girls. And it is the power of these women and the women that come in that I hear their voices all the time. And I like that. And I think that's, you know, I love that kind of storytelling. Yeah, it's great. And of course, your readers, that's something your readers really respond to, too. You know, they know that in the, your books, that's what they're going to get when they open the cover. So it's great for them to have that sort of reassurance and knowing what they're going to get when they open the books. Yeah. 
Yeah. And just connected to that, Deb, I noticed on your website um, a project that's also very close to your heart. Um, it's Oasis Rescues, it's Project Mariposa. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but could you tell us a little bit about that and your involvement in that? Okay, so Oasis Rescue is my nonprofit that, that uh, I started back when I had the beauty school in Afghanistan. And Project Mariposa is basically, uh, it's a way, way that, um, I, I had a beauty school in Afghanistan and I still wanted to continue to educate women in the, the industry of the arts of, of hairdressing and the beauty industry, but I didn't want to do a school again. So now what we do is we raise money for scholarships for, they can learn nails, they can learn facials, they can learn massages, they can uh, learn makeup. And so it's still educating the women in the, in, in my industry, which gives, you know, it's really good for them because it gives them a way to basically educate and feed their family. Um, I also, uh, you know, still to this day, we do all our own in-house training for all my staff at my salon at Tibito's. So um, we just keep, it's, it's about empowering the women. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And you sound like you're very hands-on with the salon and all those projects too, Deb. How do you actually get time to write your books? Well, the one the one thing about my salon in Mexico is we're kind of seasonal because it's um we're in a we're in a um tourist area. And so in the summertime when it's like a thousand degrees, uh you know, nobody's here. Right. So I, I always try to time everything towards when I am uh, very slow in the sun. It's easier. Like during high season, during the winter time, when all the tourists are here, I can't even, I don't even know what time of day it is. Yes. <laughs> so. Do you have people come to the salon particularly, like visit the salon particularly to see you and to be in your salon, you know, because they've heard of you through your books? Yo, yeah, oh, absolutely all the time. Yeah. yeah. It's really funny. I've had people um, schedule vacations to Mexico and they come to, they want to, uh, I have a book called The House on Carnage or uh, in different countries, it's called Margarita Wednesdays. And they read that and they want to experience the house on Carnival Street. I've had people, I live on, on Carnival Street. Okay. I literally had people going, is this where Debbie lives? Yes, is this? <laughs> yeah, no, they are, people are coming in all the time to the salon. Um, I love that. And, you know, it's my used to it. It's, it's, a great way to connect with readers too and to to meet new people but um just talking about all that side of it could you tell us just very quickly or not very quickly however you like to tell us are you a, a plotter or a pantser in terms of your writing and you know do you plan your books out or do you just just start writing and then how do you go about you know getting your book from that that seed of the idea to that finished product So that, that's a really interesting question. I would say that it's a combo, right? Because um, the, the story, once, once I have a location and a, and a basic storyline, then, you know, I, I really do try to get it all put together uh, uh, loosely, let's say loosely together before I actually go and do the research. But then once the research happens, my, my thing is I like to walk in the steps of my uh, characters. I want to know, I want to experience everything that they're going to experience. And sometimes that's when I realize that this storyline absolutely cannot happen 
or this is when I, I find, or like for instance, Samira, right? I didn't know quite who Samira was when I went to Morocco. I just, I knew she was a character, but she wasn't full and rich. She just, she, I knew what, I knew what she could do. I, but I didn't know what she looked like as a child. I didn't know what she, I didn't know her background. Mm. And that all happened when I was in Morocco. So I think that it's a combo. Um, and, and then once, you know, I mean, when I'm, when I'm researching, I mean, there is hundreds of hours of video. There is hundreds of hours of recording everything. And there's, you know, I mean, going through it's, it's chaotic, right? Because there's so much video and there's so much pictures so that I can, I, I timeline it out, like on, on the drive from Fez to Imishil, that was a nine hour drive. I have every hour of that on video. So, wow. I mean, I, I record everything. And so that is, so I can pull, like I can go back and I can say, okay, you know, uh, when we were three hours in, this is what I saw. Yeah. So it's a lot of work, but I love it. I'm very visual, right? And so, um, so, and you just never know when you are on those trips, what you're going to run into, how it's going to be. And, you know, it was the same way when I went to Haiti for, uh, you know, I went to Haiti and went Oman and Zanzibar. It, it all happened the exact same way. Mm, brilliant. Yeah. Well, it, it, as I said, it comes through in the writing because those little details really put you in the place, um, you know, for the setting. Um, Deb, if there, we Thank do you. have a lot of writers who listen to this podcast and I'm just wondering if what would be your, I guess, most important piece of advice to write people who are out there writing, maybe they don't have a book published yet. They're sort of hoping to get published, what would you say to those writers? You know, I, I would say that, you know, if this is your passion, if this is the desire of your heart, so to speak, you know, you need to write the book, right? And um, to maybe not chase the publishers, maybe not chase that, maybe not chase money, not chase the agent, but just get your story, get it down, write it. Because once that happens, it, it is something magical about when mm -hmm. it is on, when you have it, when you've written it. And then you just, you don't know what's gonna happen until it's actually down on paper. I mean, I, I tell, um, I get a lot of clients that come in to the salon and they're older, right? And they, they've they always written, but they've never written a book, but they've written their blogs and stuff mm. like that. I say, you know what? R write your history, share that story with your grandkids. You yeah. know, if you get a publisher, you get a publisher. If you don't, you don't. But still, there's something really magical that happens within when you're writing down that story that wants to come out. And I think letting that story out is so crucial. Yeah, I agree. It's got goosebumps listening to you talk about that. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you <laughs> the final, almost final question that I like to ask on these episodes, Deb, and I, I think we've already seen a, a hint of that, but what would you say is at the heart of your writing? Um, at the heart of my, I, I think fr uh, female friendships is always at the heart of my writing. Mm. Yeah. Exploring those ups and downs and the, the connections. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And are we allowed to have a little 
hint at what you're working on now or next, what's coming next? Well, I've got a story that's very, very close to my heart right now that I am in the very, very beginning stages of it. I know the story. Uh, it's a familiar story that I have gone through myself. And I've been, I've been working on this since about 2008. So, I mean, I have it wow. in my head, right? Um, and I've, I've taken a lot of notes. I know how, I know the beginning, middle and end of this story, but I want to set it in um, a Latin country, but, and I'm thinking that I want to set it in Colombia. Okay. But I can't, can't travel there. And mm. I can't, I kind of am stuck with doing not very much with it right now. It's kind of at a, a, a standstill until yeah. I can see if this, if Columbia will work for the story that I want to tell. So I'm kind of, and I do want to take uh, Charlie and B there also. So I'm just waiting till the, things get a little bit easier with a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, we'll look forward to that one. And I I know, you know, as we said, you are on Instagram, Deb. Is that the best, best place for people to find you on social media at the moment? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, um, Deb, D-E-B-B underscore R-O-D, Rod, Deb Rod. Uh, or you can find me on Facebook. I mean, I'm in both places, so. Yeah, and we'll put all that in the show notes as well. Well, all the best with the new one, yeah. and I hope you get to Columbia soon, Deb, for that research, because I'll be looking forward to reading that one. And thank you so much for a wonderful book in The Moroccan Daughter and for sharing so much of, of your writing life and your stories with us today. And thank you so much for uh, having me and just taking the time out of your life to do this interview. Thanks so much, Deb. Bye.